my prayer life is vibrant and it's active daily. I like to commune with God at nighttime. I get under those warm covers and I kiss my wife goodnight and I just start talking to God. Just me and God, tell him everything. <sighs> Makes me just sleepy just thinking about it. And there I am, just laying in bed, laying out my request to him, and he's hearing me, and I know that I'm in good company. Where was I? The efficiency of one's prayers are directly congruent to the position of one's body. Therefore, the legs should be saying, God, help me. Amen. There are times that me and God do not talk, and that is not God's fault. That is mine. I just get so busy. And so when I do end up talking to God, I really just try to impress him, give him a show, to just to show him how much I love him. So excuse me, will you, as I pray to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, Heavenly Father, beseech me not unto thee, how now, brown cow? Oh, thy soul is so dry, and if I can just catch a morsel of who you are, so verily, merrily, down the stream. God, I, I just want to be used by you, God, I want... I want to be salt and light and light. Salt and sight and loud and peppers and oregano and pepperoni and black olives and just a little bit. When I like to get my prayer on, uh, there's some things I keep in mind. Um, I think it's totally awesome that uh, God is like Santa Claus and he wants to give you the things that you want. Therefore, you need to keep lists of things. My list currently has 745 prayer requests on them. So then when I go to the Lord in prayer, it looks a little something like this. I'll just pray real quick. Um, let's see. The uno thing on my list is my mom. And so I'll pray for her now. Dear Heavenly Father, I lift up this sweet salt of the earth lady that you have blessed me with to be my mother. And I tell you thank you. And although I know that I'm called to respect her and I give her all due respect, there's also an issue of something she truly needs, and that is to stop a yapping. Lord, she yaps. And she doesn't know how to stop yapping. So could you please make her mute just for a day? <laughs> Nothing permanent. Don't hurt her. I love her. Just mute her. Take your big God remote and push mute on her channel. That would be great. Henceforth, I would go on and pray all 746 things. <laughs> All right. Well, the skit, skit guys do a great job of setting any, any conversation up, but they did a great job setting this one up as we consider and think about prayer for a little bit this morning in our time this morning. Perhaps that was uh, someone you knew, someone you maybe still know. Maybe that was like a, a mirror held up to you this morning. Um, but I hope that we'll walk away today with just maybe a little bit more understanding of prayer than when we arrived this morning today. Again, welcome. For those that don't know me, my name is Nate. And uh, those that have been here a while were used to kind of seeing me on stage uh, a whole lot more as I uh, transitioned recently away from uh, doing the full-time worship side. I was doing worship and youth, so I was doing two things. And uh, so I've transitioned into uh, staying with the youth, obviously, but then adding on the communication director and online pastor. So I uh, really downsized from two to, to three you can see my negotiation skills are just terrible. Uh, they're just terrible. I don't, Mark just, I don't know what he did to me, but I said yes. No, for real though, when I'm in a different country and I have to bargain for something, oh, it's just terrible. I don't like doing it. I'm, I'm an American. I'm used to fixed prices, and unless I have a coupon with me, I expect to pay the price that's there on the board or on the screen or whatever. And so when I go to a different country and have to bargain, Oh, let me tell you, the first time, first time I ever did this, I was in Guatemala, and I actually had to have a student in the youth group do it for me. I was just like, no, no, no. Here, you take my money, go bargain for me. I just don't want to do that, please. And uh, I'm a little bit better now, but still not one of my favorite things on the face of this planet to do. So that's one thing about me. Second thing is, I'm a middle child. Anybody else middle child in here? Let's see you. Yeah, okay. So maybe 10, 15, 20% of us middle children. That's awesome. So you get what I'm about to say when that you're kind of largely forgotten in your family. 
There's the oldest child and who's perfect. In my case, it's an older sister. She's just perfect, never did anything wrong. Um, but she was kind of just that shining light, and parents' focus was there. And then I came along, and uh, then shortly after, my younger brother came along, who needed all the attention, as most babies in the families do, right? You know what I'm saying? And so here I am just kind of lost in the middle. Like, I think it was just a couple years ago, my parents actually learned my name. <laughs> and they named me. I don't, I don't understand how that works. But uh, I say that just to say that we just wrapped up a series called I Quit. It's kind of like the older sibling, just perfect series. It was just, it was great. I, if you missed it, I challenge you to go back and, and review it, look at it. There were some great, great, great topics in there. And then next week, kind of the younger siblings coming along, it's going to need a lot of attention. It's going to focus us around a, a particular Old Testament character that so many of us have kind of grown up because of, of things that he experienced. It's just unbelievable the things that he experienced um, and, and God walked through with him. And so I'm excited about that. And I realize that this is just a single standalone message, kind of like a middle child. It's easily forgotten in the midst of some great things that just happened and some great things coming up. Uh, but I hope today that we'll perhaps walk away with a little new insight into how we pray. Now, a third thing about me is that I often uh, have to spend time searching for images on Google. And so I'm looking for things. I look for inspiration, uh, ways to help tell stories, ways to, to help uh, tell, a, like I said, a story, uh, even if it's simply about inviting something to an event. Uh, uh, images are powerful, and so uh, one of the frustrating things is just the amount of time it sometimes takes to find inspiration. Uh, and usually what happens to me is I'm finding like some great images, like, oh, that's really speaking to me, and then I go and I click on it, and it is the lowest resolution possible. Like, I can't do anything with that. It's just, it's just not good. I can't really do anything other than be inspired by it at a distance, but I cannot take that into Photoshop and, and you know, crop out some things and blur some things and do anything with it just because it's too small. And so then I go looking. I, I love that image, so I go looking. Just scroll, 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 scroll. Don't see it. Scroll, 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 scroll. Just for hours on end, it feels like trying to find that image in the size that I could actually do something with. Well, a couple months ago, I was in the process of doing this or having a conversation with Josh Bowen about that. And, and he kind of just said, hey, Nate, there's a trick. Do you not know this? And, and for me, it's like, wait, 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 this is about to be life-changing. This is amazing. Please do tell me. And so he said, yeah, once you find that image, just left-click on it and start to drag it up towards the Google search bar. And when you do, this box, like translucent box appears, and you just drop it. And when you do, Google searches the Internet for every single image just like it in all the sizes that exist. And I'm like, oh. I just got my life back. I just got so much time back. And on top of that, if you already have the image on your computer, you can open that folder, drag that image, and it also Google will search for that image that you already have, but maybe you're looking for it in a different resolution than you currently have. It's groundbreaking. I love that. And I say that to say that the, the, the story we're going to look at, the, the circumstances and situation we're going to look at today are very similar in that a group of people, we, we know them uh, Christians as the disciples, these were the guys that that uh, Jesus was mentoring and preparing to, to launch uh, the early church. And uh, they asked him a question. They saw something that Jesus was doing, and, and they were perhaps perplexed by it a little bit because what and how Jesus did something, prayer, was not kind of the cultural norm. And so they asked Jesus, hey, teach us how to pray. And so we get that insight um, in, in Luke 11, which is the parallel passage, we're not going to land there, so I'm not going to ask you to turn there because we're going to be there so briefly. But if you will, turn to Matthew chapter 6. If you've got a Bible or a smartphone, Matthew chapter 6. Like I said, there's a parallel passage, which is simply we have four different individuals uh, take on the life and ministry of Jesus. It's a powerful thing that we don't, we don't just have one person's eyewitness um, account of Jesus and his life and his ministry. We have four different people, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And so quite often they wrote about some different things. Uh, different things were interested in them. They were led by the Holy Spirit to write about different things. They would, even in the same type of story or miracle, they would include maybe different phrases. Um, but there's some overlap as well. And so we call them the parallel passages. So the parallel passage to Matthew 6 is Luke 11. And in Luke, we get the disciples asking Jesus the question, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. So keep in mind, these are 12 Jewish guys grown up around prayer. Like prayer is part of their culture. Prayer is part of them. I'm sure they've prayed before. This is not new to them. This is not a new concept. 
And so when they see and observe Jesus, though, something intrigues them. So they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, before we get to the passage we're going to look at today, there's a couple things just to kind of give some, in co some context to what we're about to dive into. So Jesus is talking about our worship and how worship should be really more focused on the internal than external. Be careful because so many in, in that cultural time were just, just worshiping in front of people to worship in front of people. There was really no or very minimal effort to connect with God. It was just about the show. It was about how can I impress people with my worship and not actually worshiping God. And so Jesus starts uh, early in, in Matthew 6, and he gives this phrase, which I think should say something to us. Jesus uses the phrase, when we pray. When we pray. In other words, not if we pray. There's an assumption that we are going to pray, and we should pray. And so Jesus says, when you pray. When you pray. It's not spelled I-F, it's spelled W-H-E-N. And then he talks a little bit about the internal versus external. He says, hey, it's probably better if you get alone with God and you pray. And, and we kind of adapted that phrase over time, and, and we kind of used that in the Christian circles as our prayer closet. It's just a, a symbol of, of, of room, perhaps, um, but getting alone with God and praying. And he talks a little bit about what you shouldn't say. He says, hey, when you pray, just avoid the meaningless repetition. Um, two, there's two things about it. One, it's meaningless, so that can't be good. And number two, it's just repetition over and over and over. Like, freshen it up and say something that actually matters. But in our time this morning, we're going to look at a couple of verses that also record Jesus' thoughts and his teachings about the way that we should pray, about the way that we communicate to God. His disciples asked, and here's Jesus' response. Matthew 6, Jesus says, this then is the way you should pray. This is how you should pray. In other words, not the way you've been praying. This is the way you should be praying. This is the proper way to pray. This is the Jesus way to pray. And, and what follows next is not a formula. Please hear me loud and clear here. This is not a formula. This is in the sense that if you say these magic words, that magic things are going to happen, that's not Christianity. That's superstition. That's religion. What follows isn't you got to say these words exactly as Jesus said them. You may have come from a religion that kind of did that, emphasized this and maybe only this, this. These words that Jesus is about to say, that's not what this is. What Jesus is giving us here is a model. It's a, it's a root. He's saying, here's a new course. Here's a new perspective. Finally, even though the verses we're about to look at are well known to some, maybe many in this room, I hope you'll listen and look at what, not just what Jesus said, but it, what he meant by what he said. So Matthew 6, this is Jesus' response to his disciples' request to teach them how to pray. Matthew 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's pause and look at this opening just a little bit closer. Our Father, it's the most intimate thing in heaven, so far away, hallowed, that is big, that is majestic, that is holy, be your name. The name that is greater than any other name. So at the very beginning, when we pray, Jesus says, I want you to pause, and I want you to think about who you're talking to. I want you to think about how big God is. I want you to come up with other words than this. This is just a model. I want you to be reminded he's the creator of all things, and he created you. He created me. And this great, big, eternal God that was here before you got here and will be here long after you're gone from this earth, this great, big, eternal God has invited you, has invited you to address him, to refer to him as Father. And I have to say that when we do this first part well, we do this first part well, the smaller everything else gets. But when we rush through this part, everything else remains big and overwhelming. There's more stress. We feel more anxiety when we rush through that part. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pause and think about the fact that you've been invited to address God as Father. Father means respect. And, and many prayers in the Hebrew culture would have, would have been addressed to Elohim, which speaks to strength, it speaks, speaks to power to affect things. But this new title, Father, is being introduced here. And it means respect. It means you're smarter than me. 
I can trust you. You've got my best interest in mind. Father means whatever you say, I'm going to do, even when I don't understand. Father is authority, but Father is tender. Father is intimate. Father in heaven, wow, I get to talk to you. And then he gets to the part where we should, we should all remain longer. This is the part that we love, love, love to skip over. We avoid this part. This is the part that we should all remain longer, though. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Then verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not only do we need to pause here, we need to slam on the brakes here. Because here's what Jesus is teaching, that before we get to you, before we get to me, we must first surrender to him. You see, you have a kingdom, I have a kingdom. You have a will, and I have a will. And sometimes there are things wrong in my kingdom that I want God to fix the things that are wrong in my kingdom. A lot of times the people in my kingdom don't understand that I'm the king, right? A lot of times people in your kingdom don't understand that you're the king or you're the queen. And if those people would just understand those people in office, those people at your office, those people at school, those people at home and your family, if they would just understand that you really are the smartest person in the room, then everything, and, and especially if they would listen and just do what you have to say, everything would be such a much better place, such a simple place, be you no know, issues, everything would be fine. God, I need you to do something about my kingdom. The kingdom of my finances. The kingdom of my health. The kingdom of my relationships, the kingdom of my singleness, the kingdom of my academics. My kingdom is at risk, God. There are issues in my kingdom. And Jesus says, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before we get to your kingdom, which is where your prayers typically go, before we get there, have you gotten to the place where you sincerely say, regardless of what happens to my kingdom, regardless of what happens to my kingdom, your kingdom come your will be done on earth, as in my earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. In other words, God, before we go any further, I want you to know that I'm more devoted to your will than I am to mine. That, God, I understand I'm not here to persuade you to bend in my direction. I'm here to make sure I'm bent in yours. You see, and here's the big idea about prayer. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our will not to demand it. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not to demand it. The purpose of prayer is to lay down our will, not force it. This whole idea of your kingdom come, your will be done, that should determine how long we pray. That should determine how long we pray until we get to that spot. Because the length of your prayers will be determined by how long it takes you to get to the place where you can say with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength, your will be done, even if I hate it, even if I disagree with it, even if it costs me, because I'm not here to bend my will to yours. Excuse me, I'm not here to, to bend your will to mine. I'm here to bend my will to yours. And on most days, for most of us, it's simply revisiting that fact that we've already done that. But there are times, and if you've lived long enough, you know this, there are times where it is very difficult because of the season, the situation, the hurt, the scar, the conversation, there are times where we're so distraught, where there's so much pain, that it's very, very difficult. And it takes longer to get to the place where we can sincerely say, God, you know what I'm about to ask you to do. But before we get to my kingdom, your will be done. And I mean it. And, and until you get to that place, there's really no point in going any further in our prayers. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. I think that's what Jesus is teaching us. Because you know what? This prayer works 100% of the time. 100% of the time. Because the purpose of prayer, according to Jesus here, is to recalibrate, to refocus, recenter our heart so that it is in sync with the heart of the Father. Not to convince the Father to do something for you that he otherwise isn't interested in doing. He is your Father. He is the Lord of creation. He is eternal. And that doesn't make us small, that we're just a second, we're just a blip of, of eternity on the timeline, it doesn't make us small, it makes us significant, because our Heavenly Father is, uh, 
asked us and invited us to address him as Heavenly Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I can take no for an answer. I can take wait for an answer. Your will be done. And you know what happens? We can pray this type of prayer honestly. We're blessed. You know what you're blessed with? Peace. And sometimes it's the peace that passes all understanding, all level of understanding. So now that we've refocused our heart on God and his glory and his worth, there are some things that we need to pray for. Jesus knows that. So he says, here's what you should pray for. Look at verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. For the Jewish person, this reminded them of when their forefathers came out of their tents on the way to the promised land. And there was daily bread spread out all over for, on the ground for them. And they got just enough for a day. One day. And then Moses warned them. He says, now look, there's going to be a time when you're a wealthy nation. And you're going to have so much provision that other nations are going to come and buy food from you. On that day, don't you forget that that food also came from God. Don't you ever forget that every bite of food you have or shelter over your head, every time you're cared for, all of your provision comes from God. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not a request as much as it is a recognition and acknowledging that every provision comes from God. And so what if before dinner we prayed something like this? God, I thank you so much for this food and acknowledge that this food comes from you. And the fact that we never go to bed hungry puts us ahead of so many other people in this world. And even though our pantry's full and our fridge is full, I don't take that for granted. My provision comes from you. I'm no less dependent on you now than when I had far, far less. Give us today our daily bread. And then he says this, and forgive us our debts. Here's another thing we want you to do for us. Would you please forgive us our debts? Now, he's not talking about your mortgage. He's not talking about your car payment, your student loans. Whatever personal line of credit you have, he's not talking about these debts. And it goes on to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's recognition that God, as big as you are, and as surrendered as I am, I've sinned. I've sinned. And I can ask you for forgiveness because you sent your son into this world. And because of him, I'm allowed to call you father. And, and I know as I ask you for forgiveness, I'm going to extend it to the people around me. I'm not going to get off, up off my knees until everyone is forgiven. And I don't want to get up off my knees until I know that you've forgiven me. You see, for some of us, that's going to force us to pray a little longer, won't it? It's so, so easy to ask for forgiveness. I'm sure many of us have been on both sides of that coin. It's so much easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to give forgiveness, to, to forgive someone. And suddenly in our moments, as we pray, that as Jesus teaches us to forgive, that person's face comes to mind or that conversation comes to mind. And, and we need pardon, but as we need pardon, we need to extend pardon. And as Jesus teaches us to pray every single day, every single day, every time we pray, we're reminded that we're a forgiven person who's been asked to forgive the people around you. And so I ask the question, what if we Christians just got that part right? That God forgive me, but I am going to plead for help in forgiving that person. And, and then he goes on. He says in verse 13, he says, and lead us not into temptation because we can find it all by ourselves. Non-Bible readers are going, really? It says that? That's like, that's my life motto right there. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. I just threw it in there. I just wanted to make sure you're paying attention and you're not. It's okay. I'm a middle child. I'm used to this. It's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine. Here's what he does say though. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this little phrase, evil one, can also be translated as evil. And maybe that's the phrase you're most familiar with. That's how you learn the verse. So that's the Bible version that you have. It can go either way. But the, the concept here is huge. This phrase is huge. It means that when you pray, you're not intending to do evil. 
It means when you pray, you've decided, I don't want to sin against God. In other words, prayer, and I hope you're listening to this, prayer is not about getting forgiveness for past sins so you can empty your sin bucket out and then go right out and fill the sin bucket up and then come back and pray and empty the sin bucket and then go right back out ready to fill up that sin bucket and then go empty it and then fill it and empty it and fill it and empty it. I think that whole routine would make Jesus just vomit. And I've done it. and Maybe you have too. Prayer is when you say, I sincerely want to obey you. How could I not obey you? You are the great God, the creator of the universe. I've already said I want your kingdom more than my kingdom. I want you to provide for me and I see all provision is coming from you. I'm asking you to forgive me my sins, and I'm going to forgive the people that have sinned against me. Now, I don't want any more sin in my sin bucket. But if our intention is to somehow get things right with God just so that we can go out and sin some more, we don't understand prayer. I think Jesus would say to us, you're not doing it right. You see prayer as some sort of game. You see prayer as some sort of trick, some sort of control. You see, this is some sort of loophole with God because he's got to forgive you because he said he'll forgive you. And so you're using that as some sort of leverage and so just so you can go out and fill out your sin bucket. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is, I want you to forgive me my sin. And God, to the best of my ability, I don't plan to sin anymore. Would you protect me? Would you give me protection from the evil one? Would you give me protection from temptation? See, if you intend to sin, don't pray. You're just wasting time. It's fake. You're just making yourself feel better. Those aren't real prayers. Don't pray if you're going to sin. God, would you help me sin today? God, would you help me be the best thief possible? It's a joke. You pray when you're de- you decide you're tired of sinning. You-, you pray when you decide that sin is holding you hostage and you want to escape from it. You-, you pray when you're willing to acknowledge that God is bigger than you, and if he never says yes to any of your prayers... Who cares because he's so big and so powerful, he's worth living your life for. That's what Jesus said when his disciples asked him to teach them about prayer. I'm asked the band to join me on stage. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's what Jesus said when he taught us to pray. And when we pray with this this type of prayer with all honesty, all sincerity, we can then move on to praying for the great many needs that we have in our family, the great many needs in our community, the great many needs around us globally. Some we've already stopped and prayed for. There are so many things around us and in us that can and should be prayed for. I hope you see how Jesus' answer helps us position our heart for worship, for prayer. Helps us worship this great God of the universe who's invited us to address him as Father. Would you pray with me? Father, what a privilege it is to speak to you, to know that we're not just saying words into a vacuum, words that are going to hit a ceiling, but words that are going to go straight to the throne of heaven, and that our Father in heaven is listening and cares about everything that is going on in our lives. You are so worthy of all the time that we can give you, all the attention that we can give you. Your name is higher and greater than any other Lord, help us to be about your will and your kingdom, not ours. Father, though we have so much in this country, so much in our families, we understand and acknowledge that every single bit of it comes from you. We are to steward it well. We are to use it for kingdom purposes and not just be consumers. Lord, forgive us of our sin. And God, please help me to forgive the people. Help us to forgive the people that have sinned against us. To not hold on to the baggage and the hurt. 
which can lead to bitterness, malice, all, t- all sorts of evil. And just choke out our spiritual joy. But help us to forgive others as you've forgiven us. God, I'm thankful that your word lands in each of our hearts in just the exact way it needs to because you know us and you love us. May that be what we're about as we display your love to this world, to our neighbors, all the days of our life. And we give you all the honor and praise for what you want to do in us and all the honor and praise for what you want to do through us. In Jesus' name we pray.